Well, hey, if you're there, let me make sure that this this damn thing, everything sucks. All right, the right microphone. I'm trying to keep it from clipping. Um, so I just did this whole live stream to nobody. <laughs> Was sending the stream to uh, to YouTube, and then it didn't it didn't record or anything or put it out in the stream. Ah, cool. And I'm getting a bad the stream status bad variable resolution stream uh i don't know i gotta say i think the live streaming thing's overrated so we'll see i think it'll it'll sort itself out okay so i already did this uh this is also coming over uh we had it a long middle day afternoon of uh double brunch so this is going to be real short, I think, especially because I already did it and I'm getting, I don't know, you, YouTube's telling me this is not necessarily going to work out. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, I I learned a lot about coroutines over the last few weeks and I didn't, I really was under underestimating them. I, I just thought that, that it was basically like async await, you know, some syntactic sugar type stuff and, um, you know, a lot of times people are, so will talk about technologies and, and I'm kind of like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, and I was, you know, quite wrong on the implications of what coroutines probably can do. Um, you, you know, not like in some magical sense, but in changing, I guess, how you think about certain structures. So the the ability to do sort of pseudo synchronous logic um, is interesting. So uh, this particular point is going back to the beginning, I guess you could say of ORMs is thinking about um, you know, th there's a lot of, you know, saying ORMs are bad and performance is bad and, and all this kind of stuff, but it, it, to me, it, it goes back to a couple things. Um, there's a tendency to overrepresent big company thinking in opinions, in conferences, in blog posts, in videos, and whatever. Uh, and it kind of makes sense. It's like a human trait. If you are looking at a conference, who would you go see? And if there are engineers from Google or Facebook or Uber or you know, whatever, that's going to seem like, you know, they got, they got the real deal engineers. If it's somebody from ABC consulting or touch lab, uh, you might not, if you don't know who they are, you're not really going to think about, you're not really going to, you're going to discount who they are. Right. And similarly, those kinds of companies are going to have a better time hiring, um, more experienced engineers and they may to some degree give a little more space and um, a more of a platform to publish open source stuff. So big company thinking, big company problems, big company solutions tend to be somewhat overrepresented compared to, you know, like the vast majority of people are, it's a, couple of engineers hacking away at something that is in like a prototype phase, right? That's kind of what most new development is. So in that context, you know, an ORM is useful because it, it helps your, with your development efficiency. You know, you're, you're, you're modeling something out, you're grabbing some data, you're changing it around, you're moving the stuff around the screen, you need that field or that other related entity. And, you know, God forbid you drop a couple of frames when the, the animation comes over. Like it doesn't even matter. It's not really what you're worried about. So that's where I think, you know, ORMs can totally suck, but the the reason why they're valuable is underrepresented in the places where people talk about why you do certain things. So um, my history on Android is largely focused around uh, SQLite for better or worse. Um, 
outside of Google, I probably have seen the SQLite code more than anybody that I, certainly anybody I know. So uh, I've had it working on multiple versions of iOS, uh, or sorry, multiple platforms that work on iOS, I, iOS, geez. Uh, this brunch is coming back to hit you. So um, yada, yada. ORMs are not necessarily great because um, you've got this associated um, somebody pinging me to tell me something's wrong with the, the thing. No, it's Natalie tweeting. Oh, yeah. yeah, retweeting the live stream streams. Um, yeah, so the point is, what is the point? Where am I, where am I going at? Um, ORMs, you know, in a more classical sense, like when I started using them, it was like at the first version of hybrid. At the time I worked at this bank and you know, everything was hand SQL. And then we wanted to do something a little more, um, uh, componentized for lack of a better description. And everybody at that time was kind of writing little, little marshalling classes, you know, not really doing ORMs per se, but trying to make it, you know, you're kind of aligning your code with the tables themselves and trying to make it a little more object oriented or whatever. And then we had the database folks. I'm clipping here, I'm trying not to clip, I'm trying to get a good amount of audio without clipping. Hold on. We're learning. That was clipping. We're learning all at the same time. Ah, there we go. So, ah, more clips. Okay. That's probably less clipping. So we had the database folks and they, they didn't want to think that way because they wanted to be able to change the, the tables underneath what you saw as the implementation and to, to continue normalizing it, which was a bunch of crap. Like they, I think they did that twice in the entire history of the time I worked there. Um, so they would write a bunch of views and then if you wanted to query data, they just said every screen, give us the fields you need and we'll make a stored procedure and then it'll return a big flat query and just silly, silly things. So modeling this stuff with Hibernate was a was kind of a game changer for us, and it really um, made the development process a lot more efficient. So fast forward, I don't know, any number of years. I actually did the original port of Hibernate. Um, I didn't write Hibernate, but I wrote the, the Android, you know, whatever. And... You know, it depends how you look at it. Like, it was helpful in a lot of the stuff we built. It, it really kind of helped you model stuff out. You could change stuff pretty quickly. Um, was it a great ORM? No. <laughs> no, it was not a great ORM, but it, it did some stuff. So anyway, one of the big problems was if you wanted to get an associated entity um, or a collection, then you're, you're either doing it aggressively um, in your background data grab and then you're, you're kind of pulling in a lot of um, an object graph you don't need to pull in. Uh, it wasn't necessarily really easy to configure uh, any of them really, any of the ORMs. Uh, or you're doing stuff lazy, which means you're getting the data in the background thread like you should and then you're in the UI thread, then you're also getting data. Um, it's just bad. I mean, it's just all, all really horrible. Like if you really understood what was going on, it was all terrible. So. Um, what was good, what's good about SQL delight is, is that you can write queries that are joined so you can join data and then get one single data object back, which is nice. And I did that in a few places in the Joycon app. Uh, but the bad part is that it, for every one of these queries, it's building another, it's defining another object. So you know, you might have one object and then and then you want to join it and get like something associated, like some simple piece of data. And so now you have a, a whole nother object that doesn't, you know, in a compile time way com comply with any sort of interface, but and all it has is another field. So they're like different types and it, it can be, you know, from a coding perspective, kind of ugly, right? So the thought was, If, if you, you know, you could using coroutines, um, 
kind of simulate what was good about an ORM without making it complicated. So rather than make this join class and have a separate class, use the base entity to find an extension function that would get the associated entity that you want, but have that be a suspend function or you know async. And then when you're in the UI thread trying to render the data, if you're in a suspend function there, you just call async await, it comes back, it feels very synchronous, even though it's not, but it's still in the main thread, but the query is not in the main thread. So it acts like an ORM, you have less entities, um, it flows the way you want, and God forbid if it's six months later and this is turned into, this is a big bigger app now and this is absolutely how it's going to stay that you can optimize it later and do something else right that's the thought that's what i did so here's an example i'll, I'll show you real quick um oh i have to change the scene i'm so new with the live streaming all right we're going to look at okay so the session Originally, I had this session with room by ID. So it would join with the room table and get the room name. And that's all it really did. And that created an entire, entirely separate class, which, you know, it's not the end of the world, but it just seemed kind of excessive. And then let me just move this over here. Da, 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 da. Then I can watch myself. What? All right. So then we have the event model. And this is sort of like an in-between class in the Droidcon app. So um used to be session with room by ID, now it just gets the session. And then you'll see down here I did the uh, event live data, which is I, I made live data, I made a an, a version of live data so we can have a reactive data flow thing for the Droidcon app while we're sort of waiting for multi-threaded coroutines to be complete. It works. It's not super sexy, but it functions. So anyway, um, query live data, extracts data, and it just does, it does what it did before, essentially. Um, instead of a session with room, it just does session. And then the only place we really used this extra piece of data was in this method, an extension function called format room time that we return the room and then the time in the session. And we'll show you that in the example. Um, this is now a suspend function because in order to get used to get room name, now we get room async. I just called it async to make that super, super crystal clear. And then await and name. And this happens in the main thread. This suspends execution while we're awaiting. And then it gets the name. In Kotlin native, since we don't have multi-threaded coroutines yet um even though this is doing a suspend the query is still happening in the main thread obviously as soon as that changes we should be able to change this and and that won't happen it works it's not like you know oh my god so slow it's just obviously not ideal and then in the fragment there's a few methods that are suspend that's primarily the change here because everything else stayed the same. So data refresh. Um, that's coming from here. We do uh, we, we do an observe on this view model. Now, to help explain this a little better, I made instead of the regular observer, I changed this to be it takes um, a suspend lambda and that extends or implements observer and then we just call the lambda launching in the main dispatcher the main dispatcher is an expect actual for um ios and android and it just does the ui dispatcher as opposed to this which should be should be background although again in right now in native it's still going to be the ui thread but soon 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 fix 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 um okay so that was the event fragment again. 
do, do, do. Another suspend method. Otherwise, it does as you would expect. And then um, the magic, as it were, happens in here. So um, we have another method here for the user account, and it gets the sessions that the user is in. This one, much simpler, it's just session room async. And then it says it yeah, runs async method in the application dispatcher and then just queries the room by room ID. Super uncomplicated. Returns a deferred, which you can call a wait on. The idea, you know, this is sort of an experiment. If it turns into something that was desired, I guess, um, by people using SQL Delight, people doing whatever, um, I'm not sure what it would look like, but it seems pretty straightforward to write a Kotlin annotation processor that would generate these extension functions. Um, or just put the functions directly on the generating classes from SQL Delight itself. Personally, I wouldn't quite go there yet. I feel like it's a little, you know, let's see how useful it is. But you get the idea. It, it allows you to do these lazy associated queries in a synchronous fashion but using coroutines so you don't tie up the main thread to, to these queries so that you can kind of revisit the concept of what made an ORM useful um, without you know really jumping through hoops and without really doing horrible main thread stuff um, of course you know that makes sense but um, where it makes sense to have uh you know, custom queries and stuff like on this page, right? Like, of course you want to do, you know, a single query so you don't have to like get every row here. That's, that's crazy. It's bananas. But then when you click on this, you know, it did that extra query all through coroutines to get that. So I don't know. It's a concept. We're experimenting with it. Um, yeah, that's it. And sometime today or tomorrow, I have to actually publish these apps and, cross the fingers that we don't get anything bounced and uh, get ready for the big the big big conference coming up in a few days what is it a week 10 days 9 days 8 days how you feeling about that pretty good wish you had another camera that could show your reaction <laughs> oh well wow. alright that's it I don't have anything else to talk about today and uh, I got to figure out what I'm doing for the rest of the day. You know, derail your plans with brunch. That's what one does. All right. Bye-bye.